links page. It's great to be here with everybody. And uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. So the, I guess the title of this symposium is called what? Renovate to Regenerate. And uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about regenerative grazing and it's tied to, to soil health. So you as ranchers and grazers from across the United States who are here today, you of all people should know that pasture systems, the ones that we're working with, are very dynamic. They're made up of a collection of many interconnected living components. The center or the foundation of that system, you see right there in the middle, I, I look at it as the soil beneath that pasture system. But the point is, all these components are ever-changing. There's nothing dynamic, I mean, I'm sorry, there's nothing static about any of the parts of the system that are connected, okay? So the soils, yes, there's inherent properties that stay the same, but the micro populations in those soils vary from season to season based on the plants that are growing there. The water, the water availability on the farm, whether it's streams or springs or, or irrigation ponds that are now livestock ponds, they change from season to season. In the winter and spring, they're often overflowing. In the summer, sometimes it gets so dry that the, uh, the water sources nearly dry up. So that impacts the other components here in the system. It impacts the forages um, <clears throat> from spring to summer to fall. You'll find different dominant species in the same pasture in those different, different seasons based on the weather extremes of that given season. And that relates directly to the livestock that are grazing in your pasture that season. There's, there's nothing that stays the same about them, whether it's a cow-calf herd. It depends on what stage of lactation or gestation that that cow is in in its reproductive cycle. You know, the demand on that system based on those livestock is much greater if you've got 500 pound calves on the side of each one of those cows than if you just have a 100 pound calf beside each one of those cows. So it's ever changing and the different components or resources that make up this system that we've got here on the screen, they compete with each other in many cases, all right? You can't leave out the wildlife component. You know, wildlife are competing for some of the same space on our pasture lands and our range lands. And uh, that's part of this dynamic as well. But one thing you need to remember is your management can literally shift the dynamic. You can shift it in favor of the forages and the livestock and so forth. So let's keep that in mind. One thing we need to recognize right from the start is that yes, a significant portion of our grazing lands are actually in some sort of a degraded condition. Okay, each one of us has seen farms as we ride down the road in our community that are typically overstocked and continuously grazed. And if this takes place long enough, it truly degrades the resources that we're just talking about. Specifically, this combination of overstocking and continuously grazing removes all the canopy cover on the pasture, causing more soil to be exposed. It increases compaction. Uh, <clears throat> disturbance and, and root restriction is the result. Uh, when you, the compaction of all the overstocking of the livestock on semi-bare soil results in just squeezing out the airspace or the pore space in that soil, reducing the oxygen and air availability to the roots and carrying on forward to the plants and the desirable species uh, being grazed out and dying out. And this is what you have. If you, if you graze out the desirable species and then you rest it, many of these undesirables flourish at that time, okay? But keeping in mind, your management can make a change because if, if we're starting from this condition right here, which is degraded, you know, the soils are more exposed to direct rainfall impact the rainfall hitting directly on those soil particles, detaching them, the compaction of the soils results in more runoff, less infiltration, just further degrades the system. Um, and again, this is a common scene in late summer in, in different parts of Virginia, like it is in many other states where you reside. And ultimately, it leads to declining carrying capacity. And that's what hits your bottom line. So, Recognizing this, every degraded pasture provides another opportunity to regenerate, okay? So, you know, just starting with the dictionary definition of regenerate, Webster says it's to restore to a better, higher, or more worthy state. Another definition includes 
to generate or produce anew. But when I think of regenerative grazing, I think of reviving the system and bringing it back to abundant life and productivity. That's what comes to mind to me. But the word or the term regenerative agriculture is getting a lot of buzz these days. Nearly every organization or entity that has anything to do with agriculture has something to say about regenerative agriculture. And that's a good thing, all right? But the fact is, many of them that try to actually define it, um, <clears throat> they define it somewhat vaguely. But let's look at some of these good definitions here. The Noble Foundation defines regenerative ranching as the process of restoring degraded grazing lands using practices based on ecological principles. It's kind of general, a little bit vague, right? One of our partners in Virginia, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, says that a simple definition for regenerative grazing, or regenerative agriculture rather, is a holistic approach to agriculture that focuses on the interconnection of farming systems and the ecological system as a whole. All right, and I agree, but there's nothing very specific in that general definition. But if you read on their web pages and on the pages of bloggers and other organizations that are talking about this and you drill down a little bit deeper, it seems like on almost all of them, it refers more to managing based on principles that, in, that are in line with ecological processes, okay? And furthermore, it relates and goes more into and tying it back to soil health. So let's take a closer look here. When I think of regenerating our grazing lands, I think of you as ranchers managing livestock on your pasture using controlled periods of both impact and rest to both the vegetation that's there and to the soil surface in a way that regenerates the life and the productivity of that system. So you're using those animals to harvest the vegetation, put weight gain and condition on the livestock, but at the same time, the amount of impact combined with the type or, and the frequency of rest at a certain time of the year can, can really shift the dynamic in a very positive way and regenerate the, uh, the pasture condition. Not just the grass that's on the surface, but the soil life, the microbes, whether it be the protozoa, the bacteria, the fungi in the soil, the root systems of these plants, it's all interconnected together. And there's a whole lot to be said about controlled periods of impact followed by rest to get this system revived again. So when you relate that back to soil health, some people have a hard time defining soil health, but I like, I like this simple definition. It, it re relates back to the capacity of the soil to function. The soils under your pasture have a primary function, and that is to provide that medium that the plants that are rooted there need to grow, okay? It need, those soils underneath your pasture need to be functioning to where they're providing the air, the nutrients, and the soil moisture that the, that the roots of that plant can take up and those plants can thrive and be vigorous. That's the primary function of the soils under those pastures. The second function is the soil should be good enough to withstand a very, very intense rainfall events, okay? And those, the pore space in the surface horizon of soil should be, have good integrity. And the aggregate stability that make up the, the soils, it should be strong enough that it can, it can allow so much of that rainwater to funnel down through those pores and further down into the soil without those pores busting or those aggregates crumbling. Because when the aggregates crumble and bust, that's when the soil seals over and when it results in a whole lot more runoff than there is infiltration. And the third indicator of a healthy soil is a soil that, that naturally breaks down or recycles the waste of the system. And when I say waste of this system, I'm talking about the manure and the decomposing leaf litter that's trampled under the hooves of the livestock and the bugs and worms that live in the soil and, and die and are decomposed. If we have a thriving microbial population, that, there are a lot of consumers that come and, and eat up those carbon and nutrient sources and then excrete it back in forms that are, that are available for plant uptake and so forth. So that's what I'm talking about when I think about soil health. You gotta remember that soil surface horizon is the dynamic space where the living and non-living components of the soil come together 
forming that foundation of the agricultural system. I call it a true seedbed of productivity. Using these four simple principles right here in this seal, um, <clears throat> one, it, one, the first one is keeping the soil covered. It's very easy to do that with you managing those grazing livestock in your pasture. Just maintaining some minimum canopy cover, protecting that soil surface, buffering the surface temperatures, keeping the, uh, the water that's falling from the sky, it doesn't hit the soil directly, but hits the canopy, hits the residue, and a lot more of that soaks right into the soil. Just, just keeping the soil covered based on your management. Also, minimizing soil disturbance. As long as you've got some cover, you're going to have some residue cover as well, canopy and residue. And the, the hoof action from the livestock, it's, it's buffered, it's cushioned, okay? It's not direct on the soil surface. It's not shearing and smearing anything on the soil surface if we've got cover. So that's very important. Maximizing living roots. Some of you have extended periods of recovery in between the grazing periods of your livestock. If that happens during the actual growing season, you're maximizing the time that that plant has to regrow its biomass, then to maintain its root systems and other, other physiological systems, and then to store energy for the next time it needs to regrow. So maximizing the living roots and then energizing that system with diversity, okay? You can do a lot of uh, shifting diversity of forages in the stand, as long as the forages are naturally present. You can time grazing events to be more aggressive against some forages and give others an advantage. Just like if you got a, a grass legume mix, you know, sometimes the, the grasses are just a little bit too tall. You need to overgraze those a little bit, let the sun in, and let those clovers really go. So there's a lot you can do just following these basic principles that are going to lead to building soil health that actually really improve the productivity of the forages and the overall performance of the livestock that you're managing in your system. But in some cases, well, in some cases, the degraded pasture conditions are very obvious, like the picture you see on the left. We know that that's, it's an overgrazed, um, it's an overgrazed, overstocked pasture and you know, if all that's left there in the spring in May is buttercup, and they've grazed out all the desirable species, and they're not eating that for a reason, okay? But then you look at the, the pasture on the right, and just, just a drive-by windshield view, you think, well, that's a, that's a pretty good pasture, okay? You got a lot of cover, right? But if you actually walk out in that pasture, you'd see it's pretty much a monoculture. And you can control when you can make a lot of things look better with grazing management, and this farm right here was well managed as far as grazing goes. But the tall fescue that's in there is, is so healthy and vigorous, it's kind of taken over. And it squeezed out the diversity of the system. And it's really not that good for the livestock that are in there grazing it. In fact, there are a lot of impacts that tall fescue has. We're going to get into right here as I transition to the next speaker. Just have them summarized right here. It really limits your ability to diversify your forage base in most cases. It has direct negative impacts to animal health and performance. There's a lot of indirect impacts to the associated water resources, because most of us have seen, if you live in an area of the, of the mid-Atlantic, upper south, and in the southeast, where it's dominated by uh, toxic end of white fescue, even on those days when it's 65 degrees and it's overcast, why are the cows standing in the little trickle of a creek, okay? It just doesn't make sense unless you know what's behind the end of fight infected fescue. So at this time, I think we've, we've made a little change. I'm gonna switch and transition over to Dr. Poor now. Okay, sorry about the technical problems, but we'll get back on this and I'll make this very brief, but um, really welcome to this symposium. And, and uh, this story starts with uh, the Alliance for Grassland Renewal, which is a group that works with, uh, the goal is to, is to get the appropriate adoption of the novel endophyte um, tall fescue technology. This is something that's been uh, out for uh, 20 years now and it's not been sort of accepted by the industry as much as we feel like it probably should be and a lot of debate on how much that should be within the group but, uh, but it's been a pleasure to work with that group and got a few examples of, of some of those uh, varieties, products out that are on the market up here in the front. And so, um, 
we have uh, we, we we meet periodically, and and if you don't know much about the group, we we do have. Uh, universities are represented on there's about six universities. All the companies that market the novel Indifide are on there, as well as some other folks, including farmers. And uh, and if you if you follow the program through the past, it's primarily been to encourage people to convert tall fescue pastures, uh, toxic tall fescue pastures, into novel Indifide tall fescue. And that's we've got a lot of processes that have been developed, and Jennifer will talk about a few of those. And, uh, and that's, that's all, you know, we've all done a lot of work. Most everybody on the group has done some research with that and, and is kind of excited about that technology. And it is amazing what it'll do for animal performance compared to toxic fescue. And today we have some representatives from the group uh, talking to you that represent some state programs. So I just want to make sure that we, that we uh, you know, we, we plug these a little bit. Georgia Forages is the program down there. Amazing Grazing is NC State's program, Grace 300 in Virginia. You'll hear from folks uh, uh, working with all of those programs. Now, uh, novel fescue, as I said, there's there's uh, there right now there are eight of these on the market uh, from four different seed companies. So the, the the product is out there and it's available and uh, and we have a very good seed supply and, and and great quality control. I tell you a lot about the alliance, but basically we 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 have self-imposed quality control to make sure that when you buy that seed that it does have viable indified in it and that, uh, that it's a good quality seed. And it's much better than, uh, than what you might expect. If you buy Kentucky 31, you've got basically no quality control and you really don't know what you're getting. So we had a board meeting uh, back uh, several months ago and I, I've got a lot of friends that work in, in regenerative uh, grazing, regenerative agriculture, including my old friend Ray Archuleta, and I'll mention him a little bit later. Most of you know who he is. But he's pestered me over the years about this sort of this monoculture mentality and, and encouraged us to think beyond that. And, and yet it's kind, of hard, it's kind of hard to with one of these types of things where you've got some pretty well established techniques. So I was talking to my, my good friend Mike Jones, a farmer there in North Carolina that, uh, that has done a lot with novel endophyte tall fescue as well as other, other stuff. And he also is a very big fan of diversity. And so he kind of challenged me that day, and I, I said, are you going to plant some more novel endophyte uh, this year? And I said, no, I want to plant, some, I want to plant a mix. And uh, we got to talking about what, would, what should he plant. And he had some ideas, and, and so we, uh, we went through this process, and I, I brought that back to the board, and kind of everybody got a little stirred up, and they you know, talked about how much uh, folks like Ray talk about stuff that you know, was really not known, you know, and we speculate a lot and such. And, a lot, of, a lot of opposition to that, but we've worked through that and decided to come up with this symposium really to think through uh, what we can do to help farmers that say, I want to plant a diverse mix. What, what, what can I plant? Because there's really not a lot of, uh, a lot of help with those uh, things out there. So I'll just tell you that uh, my last uh, thing here before I turn it over to Jennifer. I, I farm uh, up there north of Raleigh, and our farm was planted in diverse mix of, of forages uh, way back in the 60s. Those pastures are still there, and if you go out, this is a typical pasture, uh, red and white clover obviously there, but the grasses here, orchard grass, fescue, Dallas grass, bluegrass, a wide variety of, of forages, and yet it wants to continue to move towards toxic fescue. I mean, Kentucky 31 is the fescue base, and we have terrible fescue toxicosis problems, even with this much diversity in our pastures. So it's something that, uh, that we really have uh, in our discussion, we, we realize that with the goals of regenerative grazing, a lot of folks are trying to do some finished, finished beef, uh, finishing lambs, that sort of thing. And if you have this toxin in the background all the time, no matter what you do, it never will work quite as good as you hope because you've got this little, uh, this little toxic uh, pest that is, 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 is kind of haunting everything that you do. So with that, Jennifer, you're up. Our goal uh, here for the rest of the morning is to, uh, to talk about uh, the fescue standards. Of course, we've already heard about soil health, regenerative grazing. We'll, we'll have some discussion about endophytes in, in diversity and what we know about that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Mike's case. So let me get to your slides here.
All right, so am I on? Am I hot? Good. Okay, uh, so as he said, you know, we've talked a little bit about, within our group, about uh, regenerative agriculture, and one of the things that we really have to focus on uh, is really to renovate to regenerate because toxic fescue is a problem, it's a real problem, uh, but it is, it's something that we have been dealing with uh, for years. And so real quickly, I'd like to go through this tall fescue timeline to show where we're at uh, and you know, what's kind of happened uh, throughout the years. And so we found, uh, you know, Sutter Farms, they, in 1931, they found fescue growing on a hillside in Kentucky. I'm a Kentucky girl, so, you know, I'm kind of proud about that. And it's a great thing. It was a great forage, and people planted it. It was released in the 40s, and they planted it widely, okay? But what we don't think about is as early as the 50s, there are research publications that come out and say, fescue, poison, fescue, toxin, killing animals, negative impacts. And we just... We, we ignored that because it's a great forage. It covers the land and it's there when we need it. And so we ignored it. In the 80, or in the 70s, they discovered that there's a fungal endophyte and they linked this endophyte to these negative impacts on the animals. So the research continued right into the 70s. In the 80s, we had the great discovery uh, and, and Alabama was a big part of that where we planted endophyte free fescues. And it was kind of an accident that it even happened because they had toxic fescue seed that set over for a few years before they replanted it, and then they had endophyte free. And so we started doing research projects, and you started to see that these animals, wow, their performance, and they, they looked amazing compared to the animals that were on the known toxin. And that's how they discovered that it was this endophyte. So what did they do in the 80s? Well. Let's plant that seed. Let's release a whole bunch of that. And producers bought into it, and they were great, and they planted a whole bunch of it. And by the late 80s, there wasn't any endophyte-free fescue around because it didn't last. So they discovered the other benefit of the endophyte is that it helps that plant stick around. Okay, so then we fast forward to the 2000s. All right, so we discovered that there are beneficial endophytes. There's benefits to the endophyte in Kentucky 31, but it's toxic. But there are endophytes that are out there that can be put into these forages that can give you that positive benefit without the negative impacts on your animals. And that's where these novel endophyte fescues have came in. And so currently, we're at the point that we talk about renovating our, our fields, taking out this toxic fescue. And yes, one option will be novel endophyte tall fescue. It's not the only option, but it is one that we really need to be seriously considering. All right, so that's my... Introduction. Uh, so some of the characteristics of tall fescue, why do we like it? It's a very high yielding cool season forage. It's gonna provide really good spring and fall growth. It helps you when you're looking for fall and winter grazing options. It is an excellent op uh, option for stockpiled forage. Probably one of the best options for stockpiled forage. So it helps you to get through some of those forage gaps in your system. Uh, but most of the fescue that we see, especially if you go into a field and you didn't plant it and you know that it hasn't been planted in recent years, it's likely going to be toxic tall fescue or Kentucky 31. And that helps with that plant persistence, but it also has negative impacts on our livestock production. Now, if we just think a little bit about the endophyte itself, this is, it, it is something that comes in the seed. All right, so let me see if I can make this work. Ha, there we go. Uh, so the endophyte is found in the embryo of that infected seed. The seed is planted, and then as it starts to grow, it grows up the plant. So it's not found in the roots. It's found in the tillers of the plant. So it kind of accumulates down in the tillers. That's why when we do testing, we go out and we cut the tillers to see if there's endophyte in that plant. And then it will grow up, and you see that it gets into the seed or the reproductive parts of that plant. And so if we think about the endophyte cycle itself, and we think about how we're going to manage around that, some of the things that we need to manage would be time of use and maybe avoiding having those seed heads when we're working with our livestock. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the 80s, we went to endophyte-free options, and endophyte, the endophyte provides that persistence, and we saw that. And it's consistent, and you can look across now. I think one of my colleagues likes to call endophyte-free fescue annual fescue, because uh, it sticks around about as long as a lot of your other annual cool season forages. But luckily for us, we have novel endophyte fescues that do have that plant persistence that we're looking for, and that will last much longer. 
Now, why do we want to worry about this endophyte? The biggest problem in the endophyte that we have identified specifically are ergot alkaloids or ergovalene. And this causes a lot of the negative impacts on our animals. But if we think about the ergovalene levels, there are times of years that maybe we can use our forage, our tall fescue, without having as much of an impact. We're still having a negative impact on our animals, but maybe not as much. But now, if we overlay our if we overlay our tall fescue growth curve, now we see that some of the time periods where we have our greatest problems with fescue toxicosis are directly linked to our greatest levels of ergovalene. So if you think about this peak right here in the spring to summer, and then you think about that picture that JB put up there with all those seed heads, you know, what is happening? It looked like a really well-managed field. That's also where we have our highest level of ergot alkaloids. And so we need to figure out ways to either manage around or avoid this. And one way to avoid this is to renovate. All right, so why are we worried about this? We see all the positives, but what are the negatives? What are the things that you may see uh, or be able to you know, think about if you're driving down, uh, looking through the fields and, and looking at these animals. And I saw this the other day, of course I'm in South Georgia now, so I don't see a lot of fescue toxicosis, but I was going back home to Kentucky for the holidays and I started looking out in the fields and I started seeing, oh, there's a tail head missing there. It's a pretty rough hair coat, it's still a little early. And I started noticing, and it's, it's very obvious when you start to look at it, regardless of the field, you can tell where the fescue's at. All right, so some of the health benefits, or health benefits, health symptoms are vasoconstriction or narrowing of the blood vessels. Okay, we're going to see fescue foot, and that's where you see that the, the blood is no longer getting to the extremities, and so we see the slothing off of the foot or the tail heads, uh, and really it's kind of almost, you know, gangrene, or uh, you would think about what a frostbite effect would be like. Uh, you see poor thermoregulation. These animals have a fever. If you think about it, they are walking around with a fever all the time. And when you have a fever, you don't like to eat, right? And so if these animals have a fever and they're constantly spending time trying to cool themselves, they're not ingesting forage, they're not gaining weight, they're not making me money. And that's the bottom line we have to think about. Uh, you also see fat necrosis or retention of that hair coat, which adds to that fever, right? They just can't cool themselves off. So from a production standpoint, all of these will impact your feed intake and your rate of gain. All right, you're going to see that these animals uh, really just aren't going to gain or, or perform at the level that you could expect them to. They're going to have low birth weights and weaning weights. And we can see that this is incremental, right? The impact is not just on a certain animal at a certain stage of growth. These ha it affects your calves. It affects reproduction. It affects if you even get a calf or if you have a problem with that calf, right? And it follows them throughout their lifespan. So these animals have classic signs of fescue toxicosis. These are both pictures taken in the summer. You can see they have a retention of that rough hair coat, uh, really, you know, the wonderful mud on top of that. They're trying to cool themselves off. Uh, you'll obviously see, a lot of times you'll see them panting. Uh, you know, they'll be sitting in, in, I mean, animals pant in South Georgia because it's hot, but like it gets really not that hot and you'll see these animals sitting and panting and you kind of figure out what's going on. They're usually finding ponds or they're creating their own little areas that they can cool off. And then this leads to its own problems itself because now if they're standing in that constantly, they're having foot problems and foot issues. You know, it just, it's, it continues to exacerbate on top of itself. All right, so there are three types of pasture tall fescue. We have our toxic fescue, which would be Kentucky 31 or something in that nature. Uh, it's gonna be very toxic, have toxicosis uh, symptoms in your animal, uh, but it's also gonna have excellent persistence, which is why we have so many acres of toxic fescue. You know, it spans the, probably one of the most uh, recognizable forages uh, in the, the, the United States, but across the fescue belt. It's just very significant area. Uh, endophyte free, that's where we removed that endophyte from that plant. It has no toxicosis, so very positive animal performance, very poor performance on the plant side. And so what is our happy medium? A novel endophyte fescue. It's not going to have the toxicosis symptoms on your animal, and it's going to have the plant persistence under proper management. So that's kind of the direction uh, research has gone, and, and we, it has proven with years of research now that this uh, is a very viable forage option. Now, if we have our endophyte test, 
we determined that we have very high levels of infection, our options are to replace or to manage, right? And most of the time, our choice is to manage. Uh, that's just what we do as producers, just naturally. And so we have the option, we can do alkaloid management or incremental alleviation. All right, so if we're managing the alkaloid, there's different points that we can do that. We can do that with the endophyte, but we can replant, right? We just take the endophyte out of the, out of the system. Uh, you can do it within the plant by adjusting uh, or in your pasture by uh, strategic grazing. So grazing at certain time periods, you know, saving that stockpile till way late in the winter to where those alkaloid levels have dropped so you have less of an impact. Uh, you can provide different supplements within the diet to help alleviate, but all of these times we're just alleviating what those effects are, uh, not uh, eliminating what those effects are. And so you can see here with some research, you know, just general animal gains on toxic uh, versus novel. Uh, this is in a grass only system. We add those legumes, so as we say, dilution is the solution. All right, adding those legumes, that's going to help uh, to improve that adding some type of supplement, uh, strategic grazing, adding rotation, rotating to a summer. So there's lots of things that we can do to manage. Uh, and in this instance, we're looking at a novel, but just by replacing that toxic fescue with something that's not making them sick, think about the incremental uh, advantages if we add legumes here, add supplements here, add rotation here. So it's, it's just continued, right? It's continued at this point. Yes, we are finding options that are alleviating some of the stress, but we're not eliminating what that stress is. All right, so there are lots of options I just talked about. Uh, diluting the pasture, rotating to summer forage is something we're gonna recommend as a good management strategy anyway. You don't need to graze cool season forages in the warm season period, allow them to rest during that time period. Uh, limit your nitrogen or time your nitrogen application so that it doesn't cause an increase in that growth and increase in the production of those, that ergovaline. Uh, control your seed heads either through suppression or through clipping, all right? Let's not let those animals ingest those seed heads when we know that that's a high load of that ergovaline. Uh, graze that stockpile late and then use supplemental uh, diet options. All right, and if we think about the average daily gain, if we look at the season, okay, we still see that regardless of season, animals grazing non-toxic fescue gain better than animals grazing toxic fescue, regardless of season, okay? But if you look at animals grazing in the spring versus in the autumn, why do we think that they have a greater gain grazing in the fall? Okay, what happens in the spring? We get exponential growth of the forage. We get that growth, that forage producing seed heads, that seed heads have higher alkaloids. So if we think about that alkaloid curve, the growth curve of that forage. So you do, you'll see that impact even there, okay? You, you have to time your grazing on these systems. Another interesting thing, as, as I like to tell people, it follows these animals throughout. So this was a project they did several years ago in Georgia where they were grazing three different endophyte status, a novel endophyte free and toxic endophyte. Uh, and then they sent these animals, they grazed them in Georgia, they sent them to Oklahoma, to the feedlot, right? So these animals are not grazing at this point. They are just days on feed to get to the weight that we want to harvest these animals, right? And no matter at any point do the animals that were on toxic fescue catch up to those that were not exposed to toxic fescue. So it follows you throughout your life, right? It follows. It was also very obvious if you're looking at the animals in that feedlot. The residual effects are there. You look at the retention again of the rough hair coat. This the, doesn't look as it's easier to see on a screen, I promise. But uh, these animals, again, are, they have a fever. Look at these, they're slick, that's what you wanna see. That, those nice, slick animals that are uh, heading out. All right, so how do we know? We do have options to test for your endophyte uh, presence in your tiller, so there are tiller collection tests out there. You can also work with your county agent or some of your local affiliates to uh, come out and test your forages. And uh, we have a lot more information, I'm not gonna go into those details right now, uh, with the Alliance and on the Alliance for Grassland Renewal webpage. Uh, so we do have options for renovation. The main thing is we want to kill the toxic fescue, right? So these are tried and true methods. Um, we want to reseed, and here it says reseed with novel endophyte. You know, as, as Matt and I talked about, at this point, 
getting the toxic fescue out is the key. Novel antifite is an excellent alternative, an excellent option. It's not the only option that we have, but it's definitely one to look at. But the focus here is getting that toxic fescue out. All right, so you can do the spray smother spray technique or the spray weight spray technique. Uh, really the main point is to make sure uh, with the double spray you get any of those residual plants that are coming back, you know, that may have survived the first time through. Uh, and then we're gonna follow uh, recognized agronomic seeding practices with soil tests, fertilize, weed control, and, and all of your rate and depth, all of that information that's out there. We have very uh, vast uh, information on how to successfully establish uh, and, and actually how to successfully kill fescue. Uh, after we seed that, we're gonna uh, come in the spring following the seeding, uh, following a fall seeding. We're gonna make sure that we're doing things for a weed control standpoint. So yes, if we use novel endophyte fescue, we don't really wanna recommend going in and planting that into a mixture originally. We wanna try to get that good base there and then start adding things into it. Although uh, Mike Jones might have some different uh, information now that he's doing some, some interesting work there. Uh, but we also want to be careful on how we use it in that first year, allowing an adequate uh, rest or harvest height and never, definitely never go below that four inches so that you can get a good, strong uh, endophyte, novel endophyte stand. Um, we really want to have minimal use in that first, uh, that first year, and then you can start considering adding legumes in in that second or third year. And this is really, uh, you know, what your common management strategies are going to be when you are developing a perennial forage base and then adding things into it, because you want to get that base there as your strong, uh, the strong base that you want. Uh, one of the questions that we talk about is if you can't convert your whole farm, Right? You can only convert certain farms, then when should you strategically use the novel endophyte? So one option would be as a hay supply if you're feeding your toxic fescue or if you're grazing toxic fescue, and you can kind of supplement them with some novel endophyte uh, using that as your hay option. You want to feed it to your spring calving cow so that you can, have, uh, you can alleviate some of those negative impacts from a reproductive standpoint uh, on those animals. Uh, you know, really you want to use it as best as you can. Uh, but also, again, an earlier stockpile option. So if you have toxic and novel endophyte, you would want to graze your novel stockpile first, allowing that toxic uh, to alleviate more of that ergovalene and graze it later. So you would use it earlier in the season in that October, November, December time period. But really, when it comes down to it, we're going to talk about the costs and the benefits, right? And, you know, we can talk about dollars and cents all day long, uh, you know, because there are some costs that are associated with renovation, no matter what you're renovating to. Uh, that could be the cost for spraying, planting some type of smother crop, because you want to go with a heavy rate, right, to smother out whatever's there. Uh, then the cost, the seed cost for uh, planting the novel into Phi, and then opportunity costs. These are all costs that, that come with renovation, regardless of what you're renovating. But the benefits when you take out the toxic endophyte fescue are significant. All right, you get improvements in your weight gain, improvement in the breeding rate, reductions in your extra input costs because you're not having to provide as much supplement. You're not having to try to do all of these extra things to manage around this toxin because you've just taken the toxin out of the system. You're also going to see an increase in your forage yield and improvement in your management right, because you have to manage these novel endophytes and happy cows, right, because they're not having a fever, they're not sick, so we got to think of it that way. All right, so I am quickly going to transition over to uh, Dr. Fike, and he's going to talk about some of the multi-species options that we have here. Um, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, okay. Well, um, I start with the Grace 300 slide because I want to frame this a little bit. I don't think we should beat up tall fescue completely um, because most of you are thinking about how to manage the whole farm. And uh, Grace 300 is kind of a branded program that we've come up with in Virginia to encourage our producers to try to get to 300 days of grazing. And that seems to be about the sweet spot in terms of managing uh, stocking rate so that you're not understocked or overstocked, but you're, you're hitting it about right in terms of what your farm can carry uh, and in terms of you know, the annual animal output. And so in that kind of context, oops, tall fescue 
gets to be real important. And some of you here are probably students of Jim Garrish. You may have heard Jim say, you know, or ask the question, what are the top three reasons for uh, growing tall fescue? And the answer is, of course, January, February, and March. There's, as Jennifer mentioned, there's really not anything better probably for stockpiling in our environment in the Upper South or the transition zone. And so, you know, this, this feed is critical to us if we're going to extend the grazing season and have grazing days during the wintertime. And, you know, as far as feeds go, this is a much better material, this frosted tall fescue is much better material than hay would be as a, as a general rule. So, you know, I'm, I don't want to be critical of tall fescue. I'm not even necessarily critical of, of, uh, of that at all, but what does this leave us? If we have a good tall fescue stand for stockpiling, we have essentially that, just that, tall fescue. And what's our answer been for that? What do we do once we get through the grazing season with our stockpile fescue? What do we do? And I was trying to see if they were awake and they're not. Okay. So, what, what we typically do, so we say, okay, let's, let's get some diversity back in our pasture. Let's add some clover. And that's a very good solution, right? But you've heard that old saying, oh, dilution is the solution to the pollution. And I think we've really uh, got to take a little more nuanced uh, view of, of what's actually happening in these systems now. So this graph, these are data from Arkansas. And you'll, you'll notice, and I've got Kentucky 31 here, and I've got novel endophyte here. You'll notice that the incremental gain when I add clover into the system is about the same whether I've got hot fescue or toxic fescue, excuse me, hot fescue, toxic fescue, or, or novel fescue. So the clover is doing us a favor from the standpoint of putting nitrogen in the system or from the standpoint of improving diet and you know, digestible forage intake. But it's not eliminating our toxicosis problems. And, you know, other people say, well, oh, I, I deal with tall fescue. How many of you have tall fescue on your farm? Just kind of curious. How many of you have no fescue problems? I, I mean, I routinely hear people say, well, I don't have any fescue problems. Or, well, you know, I give my cows some shade. And, and I, um, I have been known to make the argument that shade is not really the only answer, but in many cases, uh, what happens is our only source of shade on the farm is also along the surface water body. And so now we're paying lots of money to fence cattle out of streams, and I'm not opposed to that. But I think in many cases it's kind of like saying, well, you've got a brain tumor, so that's why you've got a headache, but I'm just going to treat your headache. Here's the aspirin. Right? We've, we've got a problem, and we're treating a symptom. Now, I, I, again, I don't say we shouldn't fence some of these streams, but if our cattle are under stress, that's why, that's a big part of why they're doing this. So I am going to make a shameless plug for Silvo Pastures because I've been spending the last 20 years working on that. And I'm just going to take a, a short divergence and I'll come back to tall fescue. But, you know, one way to increase diversity, for that's what we're here to talk about, is to add a tree to a system, or not a tree, a set of trees to a system. And we've been doing some of that in Virginia. Um, and to, to some good effect. We know that adding shade to the system improves animal welfare. Just this slide is of some short duration studies that some graduate students have been doing the past couple of years. And you can see the red line, or excuse me, the green line represents uh, toxic tall fescue or open pasture. It actually would be kind of mixed, but it's predominantly fescue. And you can see that through the day, we have somewhere between one and two degree temperature differential just because those animals don't have much access to shade uh, during, during the day. Whereas our animals that are on the tree systems, they're cooler, they're more comfortable. And this translates into a very real physiological measure. Uh, these are cortisol values. And day 21 and day 42, the animals are on study. Day 77, they're off of the study. And what happens is those animals that are under that shade, they have lower cortisol levels that we can measure. We're taking hair samples and measuring the cortisol. 
Um, so we know that they are bathed in less of this stress hormone when they have access to shade in our civil pasture systems. There's also the other aspect of adding trees to the system and from the context of the, or the benefits of diversity, and that is in terms of resource utilization, where you've got uh, the trees and the grasses may be competing for resources, like light coming into the system, but because of that kind of competition or greater usage, I get greater usage of the total solar energy and have greater efficiency of use of the solar energy. And they may be also uh, tapping other sources, uh, nutrients, water, that sort of thing in the system that the, that the grasses can't get. So there's a lot of potential benefit from the standpoint of a regenerative agricultural system, fescue or independent of fescue, where adding trees back uh, makes some sense. All right, so let's go back to our more typical forage system. Forget the trees for a second. Don't, get lo don't lose the pasture for the trees or, or vice versa, however you say that. Some approaches to diverse or creating diverse systems. You know, Jennifer's talked to you about how you might get tall fescue uh, renovated, but we th can think about this species and temporal diversity in a, in a number of frames, right? We've got cool season and warm season grasses, so we've got that temporal diversity as well as species diversity. Uh, legumes to put nitrogen back into the system or forbs that, that might be able to um, add some different nutritional profiles. And we can do that with perennials and annuals. And you know, so we can use all of those different species to meet different needs across the farm landscape. I also, I would throw in woody species. Uh, some of you may have heard Buck Holsinger talk today about browsing animals on woodies. You know, I got some goats down here grazing some um, uh, uh, locust shrubs, that sort of thing, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I would say that some of these species, whether they're woodies or forbs or legumes, may be helping us with biochemical diversity. Uh, if, 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 if any of you like beer or alcohol, you know, you might go drink beer all day, but you know, if that's all you have, it's going to be pretty toxic for you. You'll want other things in the diet. If the only thing you're eating in the pasture or the predominant uh, component of your diet is tall fescue, it's going to be Kentucky 31, right? Lots of alkaloids. Well, if there is diverse plant biochemistry, we have evidence that tannins, isoflavones, have uh, beneficial effects in terms of reducing toxicity because they have offsetting effects in physiology or they may be binding up some of these t toxins in the diet. So you know, species like bird's foot trefoil, uh, or, or locusts or whatever may be providing other chemistries that are helping us uh, to deal with that. Uh, red clover has biocanon A, which is a, an isoflavone, which is shown to have some anti-effects relative to the, the effect of the alkaloids. Um, root architecture, that may be a strange one to think about from a diversity standpoint, but root architecture may be something that we want to play with to tap into nutrient layers that are further down in the, in the system or to break up clay pans. So we may want to be thinking about tillage radish or other species that we can add to help uh, affect some change in the, in the soil uh, to help that system be more productive. And then of course there's symbionts and wildlife. The, the image is hard to see, a number of bees on the sunflower. Um, but, you know, there may be a whole host of other sort of ecosystem services that we might want to approach uh, with diversity as our or, or use diversity to, to achieve those outcomes. So how do you do that? I mean, you know, does it, is it realistic to have tall fescue, novel fescue, and switchgrass growing together in the same uh, plot of ground? Maybe not. You know, there's a number of approaches to improve diversity across that farm landscape. We can use aggregated mixtures, you know, red clover and, and tall fescue, or whatever that might be on the cool season side, or we might use different spaces to increase that, that diversity. And I think it's important, though, that we reflect on, it's not just a matter of, well, we're going to put it out there and let it go. Management is key here, and we have to be adaptive. Now, I come out of the university setting, and what's the, the standard answer for an academic type to a question? It depends. It depends. So, you know, people get frustrated by that. You know, are you looking for a cookbook? Is Mother Nature a cookbook? Do you remember the flood of 72? 
Was it flooding of 72 or in 73? No, you had the drought of 73. How do you deal with that? So we have to be adaptive and we have to be willing to think about how do we use these different components and what are the management implications. I like to say that cows are great land management tools, but they are terrible land managers. And that's your job. Right? So we have a lot of options, and we have to think about how do we use the best management that we know of to get to these ends of reduced environmental impact or improvements in, in the animal's health and well-being and in the end consumer's health and well-being. So again, a lot of people think, well, you know, I don't have any fescue problems, or you know, why, why do I worry about uh, toxic fescue in a pasture mix? from a diversity standpoint. And this is, this is my one um, ecology slide that I'm going to go over. The, the yellow bars represent endophyte-free fescue. The red bars represent endophyte-infected toxic fescue. And the gray bars are endophyte-infected, or endophyte-enhanced, or whatever you want to call it. We would call these novel endophyte or novel fescues. So these four bars have fescue, or excuse me, have an endophyte. This does not. And when this uh, ecology study was done in Kentucky, and when they looked at the fescue percentages uh, of the stand, what they found is without the endophyte, the fescue was about 20% of the stand, versus with the endophyte, you're up closer to 60%. Now, I'm not opposed to that 60% if I've got to have that material to get my winter stockpile taken care of, right? I have different horses for different courses. That's okay. But if I'm thinking about creating more complex mixture, maybe I need to start with endophyte free fescue. On the flip side, I had a whole lot of other grass species, or represented here by a, a, a whole lot less other grass species where I had the endophyte present in the tall fescue. And you get similar sorts of results here with forbs, where you have a little higher level of forbs um, with the endophyte free than with the wild type endophyte sort of intermediate with these other novel endophytes. So if you're after diversity as part of your regenerative efforts, and, and if you're thinking, well, I'll, I'll just live with my Kentucky 31, okay, if you're resolved to do that, you're resigned to doing that, think about how to best manage that. But don't walk out of here thinking that that toxic endophyte has no, you know, has no real implications or impact on the system, because that's just not the case. So I'll leave you with this prairie picture. It's now time for Dr. Poor to come up and uh, talk about some efforts that have been going on in North Carolina to create some diversity in the system. And uh, I think that'll be good. Okay, thanks, John. And this is the ultimate tag team symposium. I don't think I've ever seen this quite like this before, but so <clears throat> just an introduction to Mike here, and then we're gonna let him talk the rest of the time. But uh, we come back to this question of how do we how do we design these mixtures? I mean, there's just not a lot to go on. And, and the one recent paper that we uh, that that we've studied and is, is kind of the latest thing says we're going to have it's going to take some very complex computer models, artificial intelligence, and a whole lot of more information we don't have before we can really dial in what do we what's the best mix in terms of all the biochemical background, all the secondary plant compounds, all that stuff. We're a long way from that. So, uh, so I, I, again, Mike's going to plant something, so I, we, he needs help with that. So, we're, we're, so we went ahead and, and started this discussion about the functional groups, as John mentioned, grasses, legumes, and the forbs, brassicas, kind of the way I normally think about it. And you've got to think about when you plant these mixtures, the success is determined by, you know, the number of seeds you put down, and you really need to be thinking about that what the conditions are during establishment, and then the competitiveness of those various seedlings. And when you've got a monoculture, they're kind of all, you know, they're kind of competing with each other, but they, they thin out and you get the dominant plants, they're all the same thing. So it's not quite as, uh, as big a deal uh, as when you are, are trying to get a good balanced population of a bunch of different things. So I'll just tell you that we went through a process like this with an annual mixture that's being marketed across the South now called Ray's Crazy Mix. And this was originally developed by uh, Ray Archuleta and, uh, well, me and Johnny Rogers with the help of Ray Archuleta. Uh, but the, the, the development of it was a, a reiterative process over about a five-year period. Actually, this was Paige's undergraduate project. 
And so we started with a, a base mix that we thought was the best thing. And, and it, it, it had too much, you know, it had some problems that we wanted to correct. And so each year, we, we had a group of, of individuals that had grown it, the farmers that had grown it, as well as some agronomists and that sort of thing we worked with that, that revised the formula each year. And by about the fifth year, everybody was saying, seems like it's just about right. We've got everything that we want in there in a good balance. So we take that same kind of an approach, and this is, this is kind of what raised crazy mix looks like when you pull out all the roots and, and look at the diversity of root systems. So really pretty interesting approach. But, but uh, we're, we're real happy with that one. So we started, so when Mike asked uh, uh, me that question and we started getting into that discussion, uh, we used this little spreadsheet that I, that I developed for working with the annuals that, uh, that basically you put in what your forage types are and what the, uh, the, the pounds per acre, and the calculations go through telling you how many seeds there are in one foot of drill row. And it's, it's better for me to think about it that way. And when you put it on those terms, it's amazing, Don, how many seeds we put down in one foot of drill row. Uh, you know, rye grass, you're looking at 75 seeds in one foot of row. Well, do you need that much seed? I, I don't know. But anyway, helps us to think about that. So what we did was we came up with this, uh, with, with the original mix. Mike and I sat down and came up with the original. And then we got with John and several others from the Alliance, a group of people that were interested in this, and we kind of debated what's going to happen here. And for example, uh, the, 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 the deep, you know, the, the, the tap-rooted um, um, forbs here were, were plantain and chicory. Those were actually the first two that Mike mentioned when he said what he wanted in his mix. And his reasoning was, well, we might forget them if we don't put those down first. And that's, that's true. So, so, but those we had, actually, those were a little bit higher, but we started thinking about if you've got more than a couple of those in that foot of drill row, they come out pretty quick. They put big leaves out, and they, they can be quite competitive. So, so anyway, there is, a, the, you know, this is our kind of way of doing this at this point. And uh, Mike has put it in the ground. And, uh, and so, Mike, it's your turn to carry us on in home. So come on. Well, Mike's coming up here. I'll just tell you, Mike's a farmer in Surrey County near uh, Mount Airy, which uh, some people know as Mayberry. And uh, it is, it should be. Okay, yep. All right, here we go. And buttons work. Go. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Poor. Uh, it's a good looking crowd today. Can you hear me? Anyway, this, uh, why, why this is critical, diversity is critical. You can see the title page. And, uh, uh, my wife and I own this, Jean, and she's with me today, and we've been married uh, 48 years. And, for, and 45 of it's been doing this. Oh, dang it. <laughs> In the start, we had uh, 57 acres. We bought 57 acres, and uh, just a little history, brief history of the farm and how it's went, and it's uh, added to 158, and it's uh, going up to 215. It's still a small place. And we have 13 permanent, well, permanent paddocks, and they could be changed from any, and the unlimited number of paddocks. Excuse me, folks. And, and the land, it's uh, nine hills in elevation, and, and uh, uh, elevation is about 200, 200 uh, feet difference in that, and it's over two miles of streams, rocky red clay, highly erodible. And this is uh, things you can do, talking about tall fes fescue, this is in the dead of winter, if you want to call it dead. It's nice green grass with uh, one of the cows that stayed with us for 16 years, and uh, uh, number six, and she's grazing nice tall fescue with her clover or whatever else is in there the virus, and, uh, in the dead of winter. Pioneer plants were dominant. Virginia pine worn out on a worn out tobacco land and uh, red root pigweed. 
But one thing about pigweed is that it shows there's adequate nu nutrients in the soil to support other forages. And the, the, there's, of course, uh, anyone, anybody knows eastern gamma grass right there and uh, on, on the top right. And uh, then there's other native forages down there, which is uh, in, the, in the next photo, photo which is uh, 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 beggar, uh, beggar tick trefoil and uh, sumac and just anything else. And when we rest this paddock, this pasture, and uh, most of the time, I'd uh, read an article about Boer and Benner, uh, part of the Virginia Tech crowd, I believe it was, had uh, decided to, from green up in the spring, to rest something and then graze it off in August. So we tried that and we got all kinds of different kinds of plants, diverse everything. And the cows eat, you know, you wouldn't think it'd eat sumac, but it all comes to a balanced diet. And that's what they're at. They have a choice. They can choose a balanced diet. Where if you have a monoculture, there's no choice. They have to eat what's there. And the soil. In, in 2008, it was like, it's when we started after that. And here, to the pH, and you can see that, cation exchange capacity and then now can you see this I'm sorry and now it's a uh, it's changed quite a bit and wildlife habitats with this of course native grasses forbs forest savannas you know we heard a lot about silvopastures and that's I'm just going to call them savannas and that's why, why we're doing that. Pollus, pollinator species, annuals, clover, crops. And what got us to this, and it's speaking of Ray's crazy mix, this is uh, 1307, she's peeping. And Sam Ingram took this photo when he was on the farm one day. He was a, he was a graduate student at NC State at the time. And uh, we, we've used it quite extensively. What got to cover crops, grazing, sunshine, rain, unrolling hay, layer litter once, and very little fertilizer. We, we're doing this in the cows that help with the grazing of the cows, and, and uh, we, we don't. Haymaking ended in 2010 on this farm. It doesn't seem like long ago, but now it's 11 years. We sold the hay equipment, put in new drinkers, more, more water lines and drinkers. This is one of the savannas we've been working on for years, and uh, we're unrolling hay to add nutrients to this savanna. Uh, so, let's see, I don't know where. And, and part of this uh, plant diversity, So it's dry. This, this is Virginia blue stem, which some people call broom sage. After fire, it becomes very palatable. So you use all kinds of things on this. And, and uh, we, we planted this savanna this uh, spring in April, and it was after a controlled burn. And uh, we put uh, six grass species, native species, which were four warm season and two cool season. And uh, we planted that broadcast. It had to broadcast it because this was uh, this was prepared. The seed bed was prepared with a forestry mulcher, and the stumps were still there. We couldn't use a drill, and we used uh, pelletized lime and uh, mixed it in a little concrete mixer. And it was a pretty good ordeal for Jane and I to do that. And of course, like I said, balanced diet. And this is uh, number six again, that cow. It was with us for 16 years. She's uh, kind of gra grazing Pennsylvania smart weed. And it's, uh, the, you know, every variety of plant has its own. It adds sugars to the soil and it uh, makes it a, the, the herd below the ground more diverse. And uh, 
the, the microbes just and it just everything for better soil. And I apologize for this cow, but it was all done with forage. And, uh, and she's, uh, has, uh, I don't know if you can see them on here, but she has happy lines, which uh, I've heard it means that they're, uh, she's in tune with her environment, but she probably hasn't ever been hungry very much. And she's a fall calving cow, and when she, during the dry summer on the, on the best forages because of uh, the, the grasses we have, she kind of does this, but she's not the only one. And we try to emulate nature with not a monoculture, but man, and never plant only one thing, never. And uh, we mix and uh, plant these, and we use annuals as one of the buffers. Of course, tall fescue we have it, and uh, toxic fescue, and we have that, and we, we survive with it because that's not the only thing to have to eat. And of course, uh, I believe Je Jennifer Tucker talked about it, discovered on the hillside in Kentucky. And, and, and sometimes I, I rode to, uh, went to a, a workshop with a friend, a couple of friends, and coming back after a novel fescue workshop, coming back, he uh, said, so we're supposed to plant uh, into fight free. So I saw he didn't pick up what we were talking about there. So it's uh, something I want to stress that I think of four types of tall fescue. Of course, there's novel endophyte, which nowadays that'd be one you could introduce and it has longevity. Uh, you can plant it. Endophyte free, which might not last long, but it still has a use. And then uh, the toxic endophyte, which uh, Kentucky 31 may be one of those. And then, to I missed something, I'm sorry. You fescue, you gotta love it or hate it, and 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 some of it on our farm was converted to novel, and we're doing this rotational grazing. It makes the cows pretty dang tame, and it, this is it just you right in amongst them, and whenever they see a human, there's something good going to happen. Annuals grazed in the heat of summer, planted as part of a transition to novel fescue. My perennial cool season mix. Now, Dr. Poor touched on it just a while ago, and uh, this is how it is. But I planted the, the True X drill, which is probably one of the best grass drills for doing small seeded grass. Uh, eight foot True X drill with eight, eight inch on center uh, uh, openers, and I planted in a grid pattern. So, 15.7, but I also adjusted to uh, like uh, the bird's foot trefoil was 80% germination. And, uh, the, and uh, the persist orchard grass has a coating, a 40% coating, so I adjusted that up. So it came up to about 19 pounds per acre, which is still not very much. It makes it inexpensive, really. And, uh, and I split that in half, eight, uh, nine and a half pounds in, in per acre and went both ways. And uh, Gene and I calibrated the drill. I went back. And this is one of the cool season savannas, but in this one it happened to have a, have a ryegrass and I believe it's a brassica bolting. And it was grazing in its early spring. And it bleeds it to this, which uh, it may be good looking steaks. Sometimes a fire starts when you're cooking them. And that's made from, from forage, mineral, and water. And then uh, these are some of my support group, which uh, every, everyone has they can use and it'd be a shame not to. This is Beaver Creek, and it's a little place I like to go sit on the rock sometimes. And learn more for these. I believe is that the end of mine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paige.
How they just did it. it. They just did it. Oh, you're I, I didn't have to convince them to eat it. They, they really like it, but it's mostly air. Did you say that it was after you planted it or it came up after a burn? Did I understand that correctly? The, the smart, smart weed. Smart weed. Was that after your fire? No, or was no, that, that, that wasn't on the fire. It was a different part of the farm. I'm sorry. Yeah. And it was a wetter part of the farm, too, in the bottom. Yeah, let me let me handle that. I guess the core question is, do I have to do the whole farm, or can I strip it out? Okay, so the you don't have to do the whole farm. Definitely, there's a few things you want to think about, and one is that you want to try to prevent seed. You know, where you have big seed transfer. So let's say you've got your whole herd, and they eat a lot of uh, seed heads with ripe seed, and you move them right into your novel endophyte. You are going to put some viable seed in there, so you do need to avoid that if you can. But the, the key to the thing is the novel endophyte tall fescues are very competitive. And so those new seedlings just cannot survive the way that they do when they go into an endophyte free pasture that's, thin, that's thinning and the plants are dying and there's a lot of barrier, there's a lot of opportunity for those seedlings to get established. We did a study for, uh, that ran five years in, um, in, in Ra north of Raleigh and we, uh, we grazed it, we let it head out, we didn't, we didn't clip the seed heads to try to prevent seed production and we had those side by side and after five years there was no there was no movement of toxic into the into into the uh, the novel endophyte and so it it it's i think it's a um you know we worry about a lot of this is one of the things in the alliance we want to do everything we can to make sure people are successful and sometimes we're probably overly uh, overly careful we're probably a little bit worried about things that maybe are not a big deal but where we have um where we have stands that were planted and then they were reasonably well managed, uh, then they'll they, they stay very very strong for for many many years. Now, if they animals will overgraze them more readily than they will toxic fescue, and you just have to be aware of that. They they don't they, they don't stop grazing it when it gets to be about two or three inches tall. Which toxic fescue, there's so many toxins in that base that they just they just won't they just do not graze it as short. Thank you. Good question. Yeah, so that's, that's a, again, uh, you, any, any of you guys want to jump on that one? <laughs> there is a market for that. There, there, most of the time, people that are making hay to sell hay that are actually trying to make money are selling horse quality hay, so I don't know what you'll pay for it. But there are a number of people paying novel festivals to sell for hay. Yeah, we're starting to see that, and, and that market is, you know, it, it is developing in our area. Uh, but the thing is that, again, a lot of that Kentucky 31 hay is going to have seed in it. And so you've got to be, again, a little bit caught. If you're, if you're buying your seed, if you're buying hay, you're buying seed, and you probably don't want to unroll that on your, on your new novel into fight uh, pastures. So you've got to, you do have to think about that. And I, I, just wanted, I wanted to add, I, I guess I have a little bit of a contrarian view about feeding novel into fight hay. Um, we know that the toxins decline in hay. And so that's, that's a good strategy of, if you are still making hay, that's a good strategy. If you're gonna put some novel in the farm, cool, graze that stuff. Make your hay out of the toxic stuff, but don't make baleage out of it. If you bale it in a, and, and wrap it wet, you're gonna preserve those toxins. So there are a number of management strategies to think about relative to that. Yes, in fact, our, our program focuses on stockpiling, so. Oh, okay, sorry. It sounds really loud up here. So, okay, so yes, yeah, so we've worked on that extensively, and the novel endophyte uh, tall fescue holds right in with the toxic in terms of performance and stockpiling. 
and uh, up to the point of we we don't um, you know in our in our studies we don't we don't baby it we you know we're kind of at that that just before the farmer kind of level and uh, if it rains two inches and they're they're hawk deep in it we let them stay out there and so we have stands persist through that kind of management and we've been very very happy with that uh, and uh, have a current study going on uh, as well that we're that we're grazing stockpile and it's been challenging conditions oh the different varieties of knob there's very few studies that have compared the the different varieties extensively there you know the, the original max q uh, was jessup that one is 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 going away from the market now it's been replaced by max q2 uh, and and several of those new ones uh, so there's not a lot there's we need some more comparisons but uh, but they're very they're very comparable the studies that have been done they're very comparable in terms of both their performance don Okay, go ahead, John. Yeah, so and I'm going to add in a little I, bit. Yeah, well, so so um, been very interesting to work with Alan Franz Lubers, and uh, some of you may know Chris Toit, who's done some work with stockpiling, and we were looking at different uh, nitrogen sources, that sort of thing. Some of the work that Chris had done uh, on long-standing fescue pastures, uh, we went back with an ag economist. And you, know, you can certainly see that plants respond to nitrogen, right? That's what all good agronomists do. They go out and say that plants respond to nitrogen. Well, so what? The baseline zero nitrogen input value on those pastures was, I don't know, probably 3,000 pounds of, of dry matter per acre. And so the, one of our ag economists kind of went through the numbers at that time and said, you know, it's not paying you to put that fertility on. So I think a lot of our recommendations for stockpile come from, okay, I've got this cornfield and we're not using it now, so you can have it forage scientists. Okay, I'll put my tall fescue on there and do some fescue nitrogen response studies. Well, that field is not a long-term fescue pasture, and so it's going to respond differently than in our pasture systems where we've had a buildup of organic uh, compounds, nitrogen, carbon, that sort of thing. And so the, the work that we're seeing in many cases is there's just not that good of a yield response to that nitrogen if that field has been you know actively and well managed in a pasture system for a period of time so you know Don my bigger challenge is not getting people to fertilize my bigger challenge is just getting them to close the gate in the first place and that's where I start with them say look you know you don't have to invest anything other than the cornflakes it takes you to walk down and shut that gate and walk away from it and you know if nitrogen is high and they're still set to stockpile they're probably not going to pay for it so i mean i think that's just where it goes yeah we we actually recently published a paper uh don from from some of alan's work where we went to uh producer farms across the region and and put basically nitrogen plots out on their farms and and also on some of the research farms and typically the research stations, uh, typical fescue plots, we would get maybe 800 or 1,000 pounds of, of yield on the, on the stockpile uh, with no nitrogen and then a big response, you know, for that first 50 pounds, a big response. On, on, the, on the producer farms, especially the ones that had been managing using rotational grazing and kind of a higher level of grazing management, their yields uh, on the zero was more like that 2,000 or 2,500 pounds. And there was a response, but it wasn't it wasn't nearly what we saw on the on those soils that were kind of new a new pasture situation, and um, so that that's really it's it's made a lot of people think, and it's made a lot of our cooperators. Mike, your, yours was yes, one of your farms didn't get much nitrogen. nitrogen. Mike kind of quit using nitrogen on his. Alan um, had one one site where nitrogen actually cost him. Yeah. Yeah, if I yeah. recall right. So, so there he. So we're working on a test that you could take and and estimate what that nitrogen um, mineralization would be in the fall, and uh, and that's that's closer than you might imagine to being ready to go in terms of use in our region, especially where he's got all that data. So uh, we need to we need to learn how to grow more grass without nitrogen. Uh, uh, these diverse systems with clover in there and stuff, a lot of nitrogen builds up. 
there's over, you know, there's somewhere, his estimate up to maybe 2,000 pounds of total nitrogen in the soil in an acre of good pasture, sitting there waiting to turn over and, and waiting to come available. So we, we need, this nitrogen price is going to change the way we think about that, perhaps make that more interesting. John, you want to hit that? I didn't say that. Jennifer said that. <laughs> no, so, so, well, so from a typical kind of agronomic standpoint, all right, if, if I have a lots of weed pressure, what, how am I going to deal with that? And the, and the traditional answer has been we'll, we'll take care of the grass, we'll get that established, and we'll make sure that we have means or tools to deal with broadleaf <clears throat> weeds. Now, if you're in Mike's situation, you may not give a flip. Because Mike has learned the lesson that his cows have taught him, and that's they can eat that stuff. But if I've got a young seedling, and I really am reluctant to bring those cattle across it, it may be easier to take a, you know some sort of broadleaf herbicide across there with a boom sprayer. So these are the kind of the trade-offs that people deal with. If you're in a long-standing, say, cornfield, crop field, something like that, where you're going back, you know you don't have a lot of weed seed in the seed bank, then maybe it's okay to plant the two together. But in some cases, you know, clovers have been a little bit competitive and set the grasses back. So, you know, you're, you're, again, you're having to manage these interactions and trade-offs. And for some cases, it might work and it might work beautifully. But, you know, there could be cases where you have train wrecks, too, because you didn't get it just right. Yeah, and it, it kind of comes down to that seeds per foot of drill row. And if you look at white clover and how many seeds are in a pound, it's a what We put a huge number there. So... It can be competitive, and some of the newer clovers are very, very aggressive and competitive. Got John Benner. Uh, yes. Is there any, any theory to the continuously raised fescue, um, like in many rent plant situations, and you get the cows ahead of the fescue and just hammer it, that the toxins can't get a jump and get going, and you don't see that issue? Because I've heard that. I'm on now. <laughs> uh, so I think some of the things that uh, they're not seeing is that there are still negative impacts. And as we show that those animals, they, the way that they just typically graze is they're not going to allow themselves to graze much below their, that four inches or where it gets to. That's why we see toxic fescue stick around. Um, but and where they're starting to witness those effects when they go into rotational grazing is because they're allowing that rest. So it's I think it is definitely an anecdotal thing that they're seeing. Uh, but from I mean from a data standpoint, they are still ingesting the toxins. Um, the other is that you're you may see that they're selectively grazing everything else. That's, that's why you don't get those mixtures that stay in there. And so it doesn't really help the system to do uh, that type of management. Do you, you have a specific study? I I just, well, no, I was going to point to an anecdote. It, well, first of all, think about it. It's a mutualistic symbiosis. The plant's helping the endophyte. The endophyte's helping the plant. The plant's got to survive. And as it gets hammered, it's getting, it has fewer resources to share with the endophyte. So when you look at that production graph of forage production and alkaloid production, if, alkaloid levels go back up in the fall, that plant's not under stress, it's cooler environment, you know, maybe we had moisture, it's kicking along, alkaloid levels get quite high in vegetative materials in the fall. And they're, they're higher only in the spring in the seed heads because it's got to save the seed, right? The seed's got to survive. So what happens, and I was talking to an agent a while back who said, you know, the only slick cattle we have here in my county are on overgrazed pastures. Right? And I think what's happened, I think our producers have learned to mismanage because of toxic fescue. 
uh, had a guy say, oh, it doesn't pay me to fertilize. Well, okay, if I'm stimulating plant productivity, and that's in turn resulting in higher alkaloid levels, that, you know, I can understand that animals didn't respond even if he had greater forage production. So the anecdote I was going to point to was one where we had farmers that had an abused uh, farm that they bought, came in, started following all the, the right recommendations, and their livestock fell apart. Because all that had happened is over the period of abuse was the toxic fescue had been selected. And probably it was the toxic, you know, the highest toxins of the highest toxins or whatever in that system. So then when you give it rest periods and you fertilize it and you put cattle on it, man, they couldn't handle it. Yeah, another, another thing, John, that I have, um, have seen with that is that oftentimes when they go from that continuous to rotational is because they got their contract and they got waters and they got fences and stuff. And we underestimate the importance of those animals being able to get in the water to alleviate the heat stress. And so that's, that's part, I think that's, it's multifactorial. I think that's part of it is that we've kind of taken away their easiest way of, of getting some of that heat load out of their body. If I'm, if I'm allowed to have a, a 30 second soapbox here, I'll tell you that if you have fescue on your farm or if you don't have fescue on your farm, if your cattle ever leave your place, the person that gets them the second time will see the fescue toxicosis problems. If, especially if you're selling calves into the mainstream system, the reason that southeastern cattle have such a poor reputation is not because you aren't vaccinating your cattle, it's not because you have bad genetics, it's because fescue toxicosis is taking so much away from you. And folks in Texas and folks in the Midwest and West that don't know what fescue is, they go get those cattle in that are breathing really heavy, tongues out, gasping for oxygen, gasping for air when it's 50 degrees outside, and they think that they have shipping fever. And I know I'm extremely passionate about this because I have to deal with this. I farm in the eastern part of North Carolina. I bring in stalker calves from the western part of the state. And it terrifies me every time because I don't know if I should be reaching for the Draxon or just walking away from them and letting them figure it out for a couple weeks. So this is massive. It doesn't just affect you. It affects the entire system, the entire livestock cattle system as a whole. And, and I'd like to make a follow-up on that. If, if any of you are in the seed stock business and you've decided to put your farm into novel endophyte, oh, that's great. But when you sell your animals that are not adapted to toxic fescue to somebody who's got toxic fescue and they fall apart, that's a problem. So some limited level of exposure is important if that's where your seed stock are going. And so we have to think about this from a system standpoint. What am I doing with these animals? How do I manage this whole setup? Okay, so the question is, has anybody used bentonite clay? The answer is yes. And the, the further answer is, I believe the running list is that there's about 125 different co concoctions that have been tried that, that seem good the first couple of times they are studied, and then the more we know about them, the, we realize they don't work. So there's no conclusive uh, evidence of anything that will work to, to really overcome the toxicosis. Feeding just improves their diet, just like the clover. You can feed them six pounds of feed, and they'll do a little bit better. But uh, they'll never do what they could do without that. And, and we have not found that magic, uh, that magic elixir. There are some uh, genetic, animal genetic uh, work going on. Looks interesting and stuff. But it's all that little. You just get a little bit of improvement, and it's hard to overcome that big, that big well, load of toxins. Well, and so. we know that there are biomolecules that that have positive impact on on these animals relative to alkaloids. Oh, yeah. yeah. But Some of the we don't necessarily eliminate the problem, and there's nothing commercially available at this point that's been proven to really just take care of the problem. Correct. So just the final word, if you're interested in more on this, uh, you can go to uh, grasslandrenewal.org, and uh, there's a lot of good information on there. We have workshops scheduled. We've got one coming up in 
uh, in Tennessee in March and in Maryland. Those are our two face-to-face -face ones this year. There will also be an online uh, training uh, sometime probably in February. We haven't got that date set, but look for additional stuff from the Alliance for Grassland Renewal. And thank you all for coming.